we're learning how our state's economy might look in a decade or two or three or even four or five. Representative John Zoka out of Cumberland County joins us. Mike Leg, city of Kannapolis. And Mike Woodard, who represents Durham County, heading up towards a, a town I always thought was really neat to cover, Milton, North Carolina. I don't know why we talk about Milton, but we always do. We do. It's in my district. A great place. Representative Zoka, Fort Bragg is high tech. We may not know all the tech that goes on at Fort Bragg, but you're in a hotbed of it. How do you size up the economy in Cumberland County, and how well is it positioned for the future? Well, that's a good question, one that we're constantly trying to answer. Uh, the major economic engine for our area is, in fact, Fort Bragg. Um, you may or may not know this, but 8,000 soldiers retire or end their term of service every year out of Fort Bragg. And what we try and do is, is, is capture these highly qualified individuals coming out of there and try and get them jobs. Mike, you have a high-tech hub there in Kannapolis, a nice city, it's growing, it's vibrant. How is it positioned for the next 30 years? Uh, don't know if that's a fair question to ask you right out of the gate, but that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, I think we're as positioned as, as good as anybody. Um, you know, we've been through uh, 12 years of a lot of change, probably more change than any city our size in the country. Uh, to go from losing 5,000 people in one day, you know, in our textile industry, um, largest layoff in North Carolina history to where we are now, that's all been completely wiped out, buildings and everything, and we've uh, restructured based on technology, uh, more specifically life sciences and biotech research. Um, it, we've been given a gift, there's no doubt about it, but um, I think we're well positioned. Senator Mike Woodard, I, I know your politics, you're, you're a populist people kind of guy, but the market is demanding that prices drop and we need robots and automation to take those jobs and it, it's cheap to make a pair of socks anymore. Uh, where does the future hold for, I say, central North Carolina as we gear towards an unknown future? Well, I've thought about this and what we're talking about today here at the forum is how does North Carolina adapt to that change? We know it's coming. Uh, I wouldn't call it a tsunami or anything like that, but, but we've got to be prepared for those changes. How does our workforce adapt? Uh, people's jobs are going to be different. And uh, we in government, our friends in the business sector, the nonprofit sector, have got to start uh, getting geared up for that and preparing our workers for that, for the changes in current jobs. Workers who lose jobs, we've got to retrain them so they can adapt to this economy. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting time that we live in. I think an exciting time. We'll have some challenges, but I think a lot of opportunity as well. I think North Carolina as a state uh, and my region are, are both well positioned to do that. And I hope this brings us together and we start those conversations. Representative Zoka, the military perspective, I, I don't know if you can speak for Jacksonville, but you can speak for Bragg. And you said a lot of military members retire. They're not going back to their home states. They're staying in North Carolina. So what kind of unique pressure does that apply to the local economy down there? Folks who are skilled, trained in very high pressure situations, especially since 9-11, they need work and they need meaningful work. How do you balance it out while including the longtime residents, if you will? Well, you're absolutely right. They need meaningful work. There is a, uh, a large military contractor segment of the economy in the, in the greater Fayetteville area. And it's not just Fayetteville and Cumberland County, but the surrounding uh, counties. What we're trying to do, what we always try to do, is solve the problem that everybody tries to solve. How do we get good paying jobs, with good companies and good wages in our area. Uh, we do have this fabulous resource coming out of Fort Bragg every year, and it's always the challenge. This has been very interesting today to hear the different perspectives uh, on what those jobs of the future might look like. And I think, in all reality, that Fayetteville and Cumberland County is, is looking forward, and we've uh, made some strides along that way. Mike, like what, what does the job of the future look like if you don't live in Charlotte, you don't live in Greensburg, you live in Kannapolis or Salisbury or High Point. Um, I, I think the job of the future is using your mind, using your, um, uh, your people skills, um, problem solving skills. I think that's what employers, that's what uh, uh, the job market is going to demand. Um, and, you know, I think that, that holds that, uh, you know, our community college, our K-12 system is going to have to prepare students for those kinds of jobs. They're not going to be working with their hands as much anymore. Um, and that's where our economy locally in Cabarrus County was uh, built on, is, is using your hands and building things and making things. Um, those days are probably over, so they certainly are in our community. So it's going to be um, the, the job of the future is going to be using your mind, your creativity, um, and your ability to work with others to solve problems. 
Senator, what, what does it mean when a state, and we'll just talk for our state, when it loses the ability to make its own things, it becomes a, a brain-fueled economy. Uh, is there a risk in that? Should we keep some semblance of manufacturing in place with human beings as opposed to outsourcing and automation? Sure, I think there's always going to be some handwork, to use the mayor's term, uh, that, that we're going to have here. Uh, you see so much of it, uh, the arts and crafts and uh, food and agriculture, those things are still going to be uh, largely handmade. Um, so, uh, uh, so I guess, yeah, we, we're going to have to find that balance. Uh, and I think what's interesting is I think about a district like mine, you know, half of it's high tech and uh, medicine and pharma and all those things where we're already prepared and we're, we're moving in that direction. But the other half of my district's rural, and uh, as we were talking about Milton earlier, Caswell County, next door to Person County, right. how, do these, uh, how do these rural counties adapt to this? And are we going to be able to provide the infrastructure for that brain work that we talked about? You know, are, are we going to be able to have uh, uh, internet connections there? Um, and are we going to have the amenities that are going to attract these kind of entrepreneurs, the folks we've seen today, uh, bring their companies into these smaller communities so they don't all congregate in the Triangle, Charlotte, Triad, and we can spread them out all across the state. Uh, so that's the challenge I think we face, uh, particularly in our rural communities. How does the current automation and robotic climate, uh, the disruption of that to our economy, how does it affect public policy? Because there's been a huge debate about broadband internet and its rollout, and some lawmakers, Republicans and Democrats, favor allowing cities to do what they may where the market won't, but some say it's a private market matter only. After hours of listening to these speeches, it seems like it's not as cut and dry as a Republican taking on a Democrat representative. <laughs> well, I, I think you're right. It's not. There's no issue that we tackle in the General Assembly that's cut and dry. No. And most of them, contrary to popular belief, in my opinion at least, are not Republican-Democrat. It's uh, We're all working for the same thing, and that's to figure out what the best public policy is. What this has uh, evoked in my mind today is that with uncertainty of where we're going for the future, and the future is always uncertain. What is the best public policy in terms of educating our workforce for the future, in terms of building these uh, systems that will help people get jobs, meaningful work here in North Carolina, and attracting those industries here? So that's a it's a bipartisan issue that we all work on. I was going to say I, I would agree with Representative Zook on that. Just before we came on camera, he and I were talking about a bill he sponsored, uh, and, and he had another bill this time. Uh, and as a Democrat, I happily signed on to both of those bills and fought for them in the Senate because, uh, you know, we've got to get beyond the partisan divide on, on, uh, in, in reforming North Carolina's economy and providing jobs and the things we need to make jobs happen here, education, infrastructure. Um, and I think we've seen some opportunities to do that, and I appreciate Representative Zoka's leadership on a couple of the major bills he ran this year. And, and we've got to be able to do that, and we've got to have our partners in local government, um, in the business community, the nonprofit sector working with us if we're going to ever keep the state moving forward. Mayor Legg, you're sitting between a Republican and a Democrat pretty strongly, a representative of the party positions. Do you expect them to tell you what to do, or do you place an order or a need with them and expect them to serve you? And that's a fair question because it seems like we're decentralizing in the way people think about politics. Yeah, well, I, I think politics in general is a partnership. I, I don't think there's a, you know, their way or our way. I think we, as the senator said, I think we all are in this together. We, we've got to work through these issues together. Um, there are local needs, clearly, that uh, we, you know, as local government, we think we know best what the answers are because we're closest to the, to the people. Um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes there's a larger perspective, a larger statewide, even nationwide perspective that we all have to look at. Look at. So, I, I think I think these solutions have to be solved in partnership together, pulling in the same direction. It's the only way North Carolina is going to succeed. Representative Zoka, is it is it fair to North Carolina to craft, say, local in the case of a city or a state policy? when you can look out across the nation and the world and see that you're probably going to be you know, against the wind on it down the road. It, do, should you protect the economy and let the technology disrupt it when it gets here as a defensive mechanism, or do you throw your arms open and say, it's here, we have to deal with it and change the way we do business? In the race forward of technology, I mean, in our own lifetimes, we've seen technology race forward so fast mm -hmm. that, that if if you stand and allow change to overtake you, you will drown. So, I mean, I think that's why we're here today, to try and get a sense and a feeling of 
where technology is going, where the disruption is, because uh, we're elected to do the best we can for the people in North Carolina. And that's why we're here, educating ourselves. And uh, one thing that comes to mind is that we need to take a better look at some of the laws that are on the book, because laws are generally backward looking, not forward looking. And it's so difficult to figure out what the future is. It's just one thing I've been thinking on. I'm not quite sure how we do that. Uh, Senator Woodard, the, I've seen the General Assembly in Congress. The, people love to kick the can. It's easier to do that than make that tough decision. But how much longer do you think we can hold out doing things the way we're doing them before we really have to worry about mass displacement of, say, blue-collar workers? I, I think we, started, we should have started worrying about that yesterday. Uh, because I, I agree with Representative Zoka, you know, we can't ignore this. Uh, you know, we're here today listening to a lot of experts. Uh, they're like meteorologists. They're giving us the weather forecast. And, you know, you, the way you prepare for rain or snow or a hot day, we've got to be prepared for the changes that are coming or we're going to be overtaken. And increasingly, North Carolina is not just our regional economy, national economy, but an international economy. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we've always been a player on the international level, but we've got to continue that. So uh, we can't keep kicking the can down the road on issues like this around robotics, uh, around automation and the changing workforce. We, as, as government leaders, we've got to be prepared. We've got to be ahead of the curve and start thinking about this. Mike, how closely are state legislators, the governor even, and local governments working together? It's easy to say, yes, we're very, very close, but what's the reality on the street level? Well, I think in Kannapolis, you have a great example. The North Carolina Research was born out of a partnership between higher education, the General Assembly, city, county, um, private sector, probably more than any of those entities. Um, and it was born from that partnership. So we, we have, uh, and I think it's going to be our future. I um, mean, those kinds of partnerships are going to be critical. So I think we have a good example in Kannapolis of how it does work and should work. Representative Zoka, with the final minute we have left, for the issue we're talking, it's so broad reaching, people might look to a piece of legislation to solve the problems. Is it, a, is it legislation that can help us withstand the transition, or is it a way of thinking among current and future legislators that's going to help us get over this curve because we're, we're going to automate and downsize whether we like it or not? Well, I think it's absolutely the latter. It's a way of thinking about things. There's no one piece of legislation that has really solved any problem that I'm aware of at the state, national, or any level. Uh, we have to be open to change. We have to embrace it because change is coming whether we want it or not. So when we write legislation, we have to be able to take that into account.